Hello and welcome, my name is Meepolis, she, they, and this is Literally Graphic. And today we are taking a look at The Arab of the Future, A Childhood in the Middle East, 1978-1984 by Riyad Satouf and translated by Sam Taylor. This is the first of five books that have been published so far following Satouf into his adolescence. Volume 5 was published in 2020, so it's likely to continue, although I have no clue really. An old Guardian article I read said he planned five novels, but it also says it would come to the present day, which doesn't seem to be the case. For once in my life, I was trying to avoid spoilers, so I focused on reading only early reviews. If you know Satouf is done with Volume 5, let me know. To conclude this point, Volume 1 was initially published in French in 2014 and published in English in 2015 by Metropolitan Books. Content notes for a diverse array of bigotry, bullying, spanking, people are hanged, and there is the torture plus execution of a puppy. Overall, this book was not action-focused, although Satouf has an eye for negativity, so if it's bad, you will see it. My final note, in particular, was fairly graphic, although the juxtaposition of Satouf's style and the violence being depicted was odd. As a memoir comic, the subject of the book and the creator's bio obviously overlap a lot. In this case, however, it's worth looking at who Satouf has become as an adult, as when this initial volume closes, he is still only six years old. According to the official, the Arab of the Future website, quote, Red Satouf is a best-selling cartoonist and filmmaker who grew up in Syria and Libya and now lives in Paris. The author of four comic series in France and a former contributor to the satirical publication Charlie Hebdo, Satouf is now a weekly columnist for Lobes. He's also directed the films The French Kissers and Jackie in the Women's Kingdom, end quote. The Goodreads description of this volume is, quote, in striking, virtuoso, graphic style that captures both the immediacy of childhood and the fervor of political idealism, Rea Satouf recounts his nomadic childhood growing up in rural France, Gaddafi's Libya, and Assad's Syria but always under the roof of his father, a Syrian pan-Arabist who drags his family along in his pursuit of grandiose dreams for the Arab nation. Riyadh, delicate and wide-eyed, falls in the trail of his mismatched parents. His mother, a bookish French student, is as modest as his father is flamboyant, venturing first to the great socialist people's Libyan Arab state and then joining the family tribe in Hum, Syria. They hold fast to the vision of the paradise that always lies just around the corner. And hold they do, though food is scarce, children kill dogs for sport, and with locks banned, the Satoufs come home one day to discover another family occupying their apartment. The ultimate outsider, Riyadh, with his flowing blonde hair, is called the ultimate insult, Jewish. And in no time at all, his father has come up with yet another grand plan, moving from building a new people to building his own great palace. Brimming with life and dark humor, the Arab of the future reveals the truth and texture of one eccentric family in an absurd Middle East, and also introduces a master cartoonist in a work destined to stand alongside Mouse and Persepolis. End quote. Focusing in on the art, Satouf's skill is evident, and while such a selective color palette can sometimes come across as pretty didactic, I thought that Satouf really pulled it off. Story-wise, while the writing provided fairly smooth reading, it was a bit of a struggle for other reasons. On the one hand, I have gone into some fairly heated debates, back when I let people draw me into them, about the validity of unlikable characters, especially when it comes to nonfiction. And I could certainly sympathize with a number of aspects of Satouf's life. On the other, I felt like the negativity went a bit far and started feeling kind of petty, although I will link to some interviews from just after Volume 2 came out, as Satouf has a much more positive view of his storytelling choices than I do. In doing some further reading for this review, I did get a bit annoyed with the incessant comparisons it got to Persepolis and Mouse, although this is what book publishing does for Totally Mercenary Ends and doesn't actually mean anything. With the latter, beyond it being nonfiction, I felt like the circumstances of the books rendered them rather incomparable. The former is certainly a much closer comparison, although I still feel like there was some distinct differences that I'll try and break down more as we go through. 
Digging into some of my issues with the book, I actually found the way that Satouf depicts himself got to be a tad bit hard to believe. As I've already mentioned, this book only covers Satouf's life up until the age of six. And so far in the interviews I have read, Satouf doesn't really dig into his writing process that much beyond referencing what it was like to look back into his memory bank. Obviously, there are a lot of people in this world who have better memories than I do, and he's possibly not giving his family enough credit for talking about this time period with him, but this seemed like a lot for a six-year-old to remember. There's even parts about before it was born. Obviously, he couldn't simply remember that. There's also the weird balance of recounting childhood memories, which will obviously be interpreted through our life experiences since then, without giving obvious adult commentary. Well, besides doing a bit of outlining when it came to the leaders of each country he lived in, which led to a brief outline of the power dynamics between Shia and Sunni Muslims in Syria. But for the most part, it did feel like Satouf was trying to hold back his own opinions in favor of depicting his experience of his father's opinions, which as a child being dragged from country to country by the person in your life who has real autonomy was somewhat understandable. That said, so far, that is doing a huge disservice to both Riyadh and also his mother, who is almost always present on screen, but largely silent throughout. One of the few things that does make me want to continue with the series is the chance I assume comes up eventually for other characters to get more airtime. Reading sent interviews, I assume this prominence is supposed to communicate Rayad's admiration for the elder Satouf, but it mostly comes across as deeply sexist on Rayad's part. As I mentioned earlier, while Satouf and myself obviously grew up in very different geographical locations, there were actually a number of elements at play in this first volume of the, his memoir that I could relate to on some level. We both moved a lot and seemed to feel like outsiders almost everywhere we go. This was one of the things that I do see as separating this from Persepolis, as Satrapi positions herself as more part of Iran, even as she feels forced to leave. I was also bullied by several of my cousins in ways that have certainly stuck with me, and there are a number of male figures I knew growing up who were similar kinds of assholes to Rand's father. Thinking about how I feel about what I see as an overly negative picture from Satouf in this volume also reminds me of how some capital L liberal Canadian Christians react to my depiction of growing up evangelical in so-called America. Yes, they really are that messed up and evil. Stop supporting Operation Christmas Child. If I was writing a memoir about growing up, I still feel like I would have more positive things to share than Satouf. But forcing other people to be more positive is not my usual MO. So whatever. I'm not really arguing that Satouf should censor himself, but that maybe he should have added more in. Reading through the final third of the book, it did end up feeling rather petty. Once the household moves to Syria, the focus shifts almost exclusively on Satouf's relatives who bully him in pretty horrible and anti-Semitic ways. I'm certainly not trying to undercut how bad the bullying is, but Satouf is an extremely successful French cartoonist who did choose to depict himself as a pretty idealistic toddler. He holds all the cards, as it were, and they are just so one note and cartoonishly stupid and evil in this volume. This might perhaps change as volumes go on. As I said, I will read them eventually to find out. I did try and avoid reading too many reviews of later stuff because I wanted to talk about my experience reading this book and not get too bogged down by judging things that remain hypothetical to me at this point. I had originally looked into reading the entire series at once, but it seemed a bit too long for that too. And the fifth book isn't translated yet. Digging a bit deeper into the depiction of race in this initial volume, there's obviously a lot of racism depicted in this book. Most of the obvious kinds was perpetrated by people who are generally seen as bad guys, including the elder Satouf. Taking a step back, the volume in and of itself did feel like Satouf depicts more negative things about Libya and Syria than about France. Going through my little bit of extra reading, Satouf often referenced the, the fact that, for example, living conditions and corporal punishment in education in Syria in the 80s was where France had been in the early 1900s. And while Satouf seems to think that maybe he's showing how countries are the same, that still came across to me anyway as calling a lot of innocent individuals backwards and less evolved than France. Class was apparently a point that Satouf thinks that his work expands on. 
in one of the interviews I read, he makes the point that most stories coming out of Syria at that time are from rich families, but he's doing something great by depicting a poor and largely, largely uneducated family, which really... Like, I'm not telling Sadoof, he can't talk about how horrible his dad's family treated him, but you don't get cookies for painting with a broad brush of stereotypes about st stigmatized groups of people. Although, it is equally annoying when people overly romanticize working class and impoverished people too. So to his credit, it is something many people get wrong, in my humble opinion. To conclude, putting this book down, I knew I was probably going to keep reading, but I also knew I wanted to rate it 2 out of 5 stars. Looking back... If I had read the synopsis of the book ahead of time, something I often don't do. That might have convinced me not to pick up this book. Otherwise, just listening to interviews, as I did, this book was the complete opposite of what I was expecting. So no matter if everyone disagrees with me or not, I did want to put it out there, what to expect when picking up the book. Maybe future books will give me that context and nuance I so long for balancing out the perfectly skilled execution of the book against the way it grated against my nerves, which seemed to be its goal anyway, I'm sticking with the two stars. It was okay. Bye y'all, keep reading, and resist white supremacy. And Literally Graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional landholders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, an Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.